Tom's a proud Cincinnati native, uh, and he's thrilled to be pursuing his diverse sustainability interests, including energy, reporting, and entrepreneurship in his hometown. He earned a bachelor's in environmental studies and East Asian studies from Denison University, a master's of public affairs with uh, a concentration in sustainability and sustainable development, and a business certificate in social entrepreneurship from Indiana University. Before joining Green Umbrella, Tom worked as an energy efficiency and sustainability consultant in DC, supporting several federal contracts, including the EPA's Energy Star labeled programs. Tom served as an environmental education and conservation Peace Corps volunteer in Paraguay from 2011 to 2013 and is an alumnus of the Environmental Defense Fund Climate Corps Fellowship Program. Woo! Having worked with the city of Cincinnati officials to implement various energy efficiency initiatives detailed in the city's green Cincinnati plan. So Tom, take it away. Thank you, Thank you Jody. I appreciate that introduction and uh, took me a long time to write that. And so you did a great job of reading it. <laughs> so thank you. <laughs> Um, so I'm going to go ahead and share my presentation. Uh, hopefully this works. Okay, great. Is that coming through okay? Yep. Wonderful. Okay, well, thank you again for the opportunity to speak to this group today. Uh, Rotary has been an integral part of my personal life throughout my, uh, throughout my childhood and into adulthood, and so I'm, I'm truly honored to be here with you all today. I'd like to Thank President Brett and um, for the opportunity, as well as Ariel for co convening this group. Um, I think that she uh, has done a fantastic job of outlining this series, and I'm, I'm really excited to be speaking um, with you about one element of some of the sustainability efforts that are going on in, in the city of Cincinnati and in our broader region. So as Ariel mentioned, uh, I uh, work for Green Umbrella. It's an, uh, a nonprofit here in Cincinnati. It was founded in 1998. And we've, over the years, we've become the Regional Sustainability Alliance of Cincinnati. We have about 200 member organizations and 200 individual members uh, that are associated with our organization. And now we have four staffed initiatives, including the Tri-State Trails Initiative, working with bicycle infrastructure development, the Greater Cincinnati Local Food Policy Council uh, recently announced the Common Orchard Project and the initiative that I work on, which is the Cincinnati 2030 District. Um, our soon to be 12th person full-time staff is passionate about enhancing the environmental health and vitality of our region. And Green Umbrella facilitates collaboration with nonprofits, businesses, educational institutions, and government entities to meet environmental, social, and economic needs of today while preserving the ability of future generations to thrive. We operate you know, in Cincinnati, but we have a 10 county regional footprint that includes Butler, Claremont, and Warren counties in Ohio, Boone, Campbell, Grant, and Kenton counties in Kentucky, and Dearborn and Franklin County in Indiana. This evening, the focus of my talk will be on the Cincinnati 2030 District Initiative, of which I am the Building Data Analyst. We are a localized initiative uh, that focuses on addressing climate change that is uh, impacted by the operations and management of our built environment. I'm going to discuss with you sort of the opportunities and benefits with participating in the 2030 District some of the businesses and organizations that have made these commitments, and what are some of the resources available for organizations that are interested in scaling sustainability solutions. So let's start off by describing a little bit more in detail what the Cincinnati 2030 District is. I know in the previous session, Ollie mentioned the Cincinnati 2030 District as one of the efforts that is focused on driving down commercial buildings, utility consumption and carbon emissions. Really our focus is trying to create a, a series of high performing buildings in the city of Cincinnati. And when we say high performing, what we're referring to is a reduction in energy consumption, a reduction in water consumption, a reduction in transportation emissions associated with commuting to places of work. And in Cincinnati, we're sort of uh, looking towards the future. We recognize that environmental sustainability and the importance of it doesn't just extend to the health of our planet, but also the health of the people that live on our planet. 
So we've become the first 2030 district, and I'll describe a little bit more about what a 2030 district is in the next slide, to tackle the idea of occupant health, the environmental determinants of occupant health specifically in our built environment. We were founded as an initiative of Green Umbrella in 2018. We were born partially out of the Green Cincinnati plan, specifically the elements that were focused on trying to address carbon emissions reductions from our built environment. Um, and we became an officially launched as a district around two years ago, actually two years ago to uh, this past week. So we've been around for not very long, but we've made a lot of really exciting uh, strides in, in that short period of time. So I know that Ollie has discussed a little bit about this with you last week, but I, I'd briefly like to touch on why, why the Cincinnati 2030 district is focused on the built environment and the building sector specifically. You know, really what we're talking about is carbon reductions and climate resilience. You know, the built environment, according to uh, research, this number is thrown around a lot in the construction industry and specifically, but it's informed by some research done formally by the Department of Energy. About 39% of greenhouse gas emissions are associated with the operations of our built environment. Uh, and in Cincinnati, a research paper by University of Cincinnati uh, uh, professors and a few years ago determined that um, in Cincinnati, we actually have a more acute uh, demand for energy in our built environment. A lot of that is attributed to us having an older building stock, dirtier energy mix. There's some other reasons too, but those are probably the big ones. And you know, all the, the emissions associated with these buildings in the aggregate globally are obviously contributing to climate change, but they also have these localized impacts here, where in Cincinnati, we've experienced increased rainfall as one of the impacts of climate change that is affecting our local local uh, local environment. So that's sort of why we're talking about built environment specifically. I mentioned earlier that we have these commitments towards these 50% reduction goals and that number did not just come out of the blue because it sounds good. Well, it kind of did, <laughs> I will be honest. But the Cincinnati 2030 district is modeled. Uh, we are in an, one of, uh, we are an initiative. Um, we are formed around this concept that was developed by a organization called Architecture 2030, who in 2006 developed something called the 2030 challenge for planning. The challenge sets uh, progress targets for existing buildings to achieve these 50% reduction goals with various stepping stones towards that reduction. It calls for a 20% reduction by 2020, 35% reduction by 2025, and finally a 50% reduction in 2030. I think a lot of people would see this chart and say, well, what is this? What is the intent? Why these numbers? Well, this partially is designed around some of the expectations of what the US's commitment to the Paris climate agreements are to trying to exceed those goals. But really what the motivation of Architecture 2030 in hitting these numbers is to push the architecture design and construction industry to strive towards massive cuts and utility consumption in the built environment with the hopefully eventual goal of achieving net zero energy uh, in the future. So they started with 50% partially informed by the needs um, uh, called out by carbon reduction commitments detailed in the Paris Climate Accords, but namely it was to change the way that the built environment operated and incentivize the people that plan uh, these planned buildings to try to hit these targets sooner to kind of mitigate the impacts of our built environment on, on climate change. So the 2030 district is in Cincinnati was the 21st formally established 2030 district. They exist in 22 other cities. Our branding, uh, our messaging, our goals are all, all aligned across these different um, cities. So it's a collaborative network. And the idea is to have these cities tackle these broader problems, but scale the solutions within the local context of their cities and community. So 2030 districts are formed primarily in areas where there's a high concentration of commercial building spaces. The our national organization gives each individual 2030 district the license to market themselves under the brand, but really how to scale the solution is our own, vary from district to district depending on what sort of resources are available, how cooperative is your utility, how interested are building members in participating in this type of program. So although we're unified in our branding and our goals, we sort of have a unique way of approaching how we work with collaboratively to try to address these solutions in, in, in our local contexts. 
So over the next few slides, I'm going to provide a little bit more detail about who gets involved, how we're funded, and sort of what, where we are today. So 2030 districts individually, we do not receive any national funding from our network. So we rely on local public private partnerships to be able to fund um, our operations. We are a 501c3 nonprofit green umbrella. Um, we are, this year we're fortunate to be sponsored by the uh, International Brotherhood of Electrical Workers, Local 212. Procter & Gamble recently committed to, as a silver sponsorship. But really we were started in large part due to the uh, funds provided to the 2030 district via the Duke Class Benefit Fund, which uh, really gave us the ability to operationalize and professionalize this initiative within Green Umbrella. There, those funding, it was a two year funding commitment for us, which is ending this year. But we've been fortunate that we've also been able to attract other sources of funding, including the Energy Foundation, which was born out of the uh, City of Cincinnati's collaborative work as part of a initiative called the American Cities Climate Challenge. So this is a little bit more about our funders. So who, who gets involved in 2030 districts and how, how, how can you participate? So we have essentially four classifications. I talked a little bit about our sponsors, but building members are property owners and managers, developers, anybody that might have a stake in a building office, space, owner, manager, what have you. And these building, these building members commit to reporting building energy, water, and transportation data to the 2030 district on a confidential basis. In order for them to achieve their goals, they are supported by a network of professional partners. These are vendors and service providers that help the members reach the targets. I'll show you a list of who they are uh, shortly. And then lastly, we have community partners, which are non-governmental organizations, initiatives of different city governments that can also provide resources to member buildings to help them hit, hit the reduction targets. We've grown quite a bit in two years. We launched with a found, founding, 18 founding members in 2018, and we're happy to say that we've now grown to 38 different organizations that are committed to these goals. They're big and small. They're city governments, they're county governments, they're small architecture firms, they're Fortune 500 companies, and everything in between. They're major commercial property owners, they're businesses that own their own building, colleges and universities. This is a pretty broad network of a lot of different and diverse types of buildings that have committed to these goals. And so these numbers keep growing and we're, you know, we've been excited to, uh, to welcome on a lot of new members this year, even though there have been a lot of other challenges <laughs> that I don't know if you've heard about in the news. Those 38, part, 38 members are aided by 31 professional partners. These are the companies that make a financial commitment to aiding the 2030 district members in achieving their goals. There's a broad range of services, architecture, engineering, lighting contractors, electrical contractors, um, data mining experts, uh, bill rate analysis providers, and everything in between. So there's a really broad swath of professional companies working regionally that are supporting these building members and offering solutions towards the various reduction targets. And then these are lastly our community partners. These, there's a non-financial stake, but different organizations that might have benefits to the 2030 district that might not necessarily be a direct service provider. This could be resource spaces, access to net, different networks, educational information, uh, program opportunities, things of that nature. So now get, getting down to the details. Cincinnati 2030 district across our 38 members have a commitment of 26 million square feet. I know Ollie said that makes us the sixth largest 2030 district out of the 22. Uh, I'm not gonna refute that point, but I'll say a lot of that depends on how you look at it. But we are definitely one of the top in terms of our committed square footage towards this goal. Some of the leaders in this space are Pittsburgh and Cleveland. They've been around for about eight years. They have closer to 80, 60 to 80 million square feet, but they've had a lot more time to do it. And we've really only been around for these two years. So this 26 million square foot commitment is, 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 very, notab is very notable. <clears throat> 2030 districts also are confined to a specific geographic boundary. So for the Cincinnati 2030 district, we have two. These are informed by a high concentration of commercial building spaces. So the central business district is one boundary and then the uptown area where the University of Cincinnati, the zoo and the soon to be uptown innovation corridor 
high concentrations of commercial buildings, high intensity buildings, hospital systems, um, things like that. Those are the types of buildings we want to target because those are the types of buildings that consume the most energy. So across those two districts today, we have about 307 properties, various shapes and sizes. 81% of those properties are actually sharing energy data with the 2030 district, which is a pretty remarkable achievement in and of itself. Um, and of those buildings, about 22% are also sharing their water data, though we haven't made too much of a concerted effort to obtain that information. We collect this data using a variety of, you know, we essentially collect this data and then benchmark and baseline how these buildings are performing relative to themselves, but also relative to peer buildings. We have different baselines depending on the type of metric we're assessing. Energy is the baseline that we're most evolved in. We use a something called the Commercial Building Energy Consumption Survey. That is a uh, data source provided, generated by the Energy Information Agency. That um, build the, We use that as our baseline to measure the progress of our building. Um, the other metrics are still under development, but we will also be establishing a baseline year, an average use type for that type of building, and then measuring their progress towards that 50% reduction over time. The thing that's really innovative, and that I'll talk a little bit more about in detail, is our health pillar. This has never really been done before. Nobody's ever tried to measure occupant health impacts from the built environment in this type of metric way before. And the reason that we're talking about this is because, you know, with changes to our climate, impacts on the environment, there's a risk that we'll become unhealthier as inhabitants of this planet as our environment starts to degrade. So the health Built, the healthy building element of the 2030 district is really kind of informed by this principle, the 330-300 rule. This is a rule of thumb, by no means a one size fits all, but on typically a building will spend about $3 um, per for your operation, $3 for utility, about $30, $30 for rent and 300 for payroll. So when you're talking about energy reduction, we're really only talking about that $3 for utility. We're not talking about that $300 for payroll. So if you improve the health of your occupants, in theory, they will be more productive and therefore you'll make your workers will be more efficient if they have, if they're healthy and they're in a building that makes them feel healthy and that will have an impact on their productivity as well. So this is sort of why, what, why we decided to incorporate a healthy building metric as a part of their more traditional rigid energy water utility measures. Um, we inf that metric is informed by localized data, but really the backbone of that is something called the International Well Building Institute's well standard. It's similar to LEED buildings, if anybody's familiar with that, except it focuses on determinants for occupant health rather than on uh, materials, energy, the actual physical building itself going back to that 300 principle. So we use the well building standard. We assess data from the community health needs assessment, the local health insurance provider um, to establish what will shortly be released as a Cincinnati healthy building district. So we will be releasing this report shortly, but we will be in our report will take essentially the results of the data and what sorts of healthy building projects these different members can undertake in order to improve the welfare of their uh, occupants. So this ranges everything from improving air quality, water quality, ensuring sufficient good nutrition, uh, mental health spaces, facilities, services, access to daylighting, access to you know, materials that aren't toxic, encouraging people to have physical activity, these types of things. So this is not necessarily directly a impact of climate change, um, but it is something that is influenced by what happens broadly uh, at, from climate change. And so the healthy building category is a way that we sort of position ourselves to try to be innovative in this space and offer a different way from building members to try and strive towards other outcomes rather than just uh, your traditional energy, water, utility-based metrics. Okay, so now this is the part that Ariel really would ask me to hone in on is, you know, what, what are these, what are the member benefits? So I make this commitment to a 2030 district. 
I'm interested in improving the sustainability of my built environment and as my, at my, as a business, you know, what are the things that, that, you know, what does this entail right now for me? So, you know, really what we're looking to do is take a look at what your business does, what your building does, identify and, you know, tiers some local solutions to improve that building, whether that's a retrofitting of your lighting technology to be LED, whether that's a retro commissioning of your building's HVAC system, whether that's uh, replacement of key equipment, um, installation of solar panels, anything that might have some impact on how your building consumes energy. We identify that, we connect those people, we connect the members with service provider, we use the bulk purchasing power of a collective to increase affordability, and then we highlight and promote the successes of different projects undertaken by our members to strive through those goals. So those are sort of how we think about how this gets scaled. And this would apply for any type of organization that might have a building. But then what we do in terms of our practical day-to-day -day activities is, 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 is threefold um, or fourfold, I should say. First, we provide education. This year has been a little bit challenging, obviously, but we have held 11 virtual events as part of our Cincinnati 2030 District 50% Solution Series. These covers various topics ranging from uh, electrical ve electric vehicle charging infrastructure, operational strategies for healthy buildings, data and decision making for energy and sustainability, uh, building automation systems, different types of technologies that might be available to help your building reduce its energy or water consumption. So in 2020, we held 11 of these virtually. They're all posted on our website. I'd be happy to share that after, after this meeting. So that's one, one element of this is educating building owners on what types of solutions are available to hit these reduction targets. The real backbone though, is that we are uh, essentially a transparency mechanism or an accountability mechanism for buildings to keep themselves honest with what they do and how their buildings are performing. I, we use, utilize a tool developed by the US EPA called Energy Star Portfolio Manager. This is a very popular, well-known tool that has been in existence for quite some time. And we essentially communicate directly via this tool with our building members. They upload their utility information and they share this with us. We compile the data, aggregate it, and generate a report on the progress for each individual member building on each of the metrics that we discussed. For our first re district report, which is actually going to be released this week, unfortunately, <laughs> unfortunately, if we had this next week, I could show you our progress as a district. But, um, but we, do, we aggregate the data for all our members and report out as an entire district, but then we also produce a report for each individual member that discusses how their building is performing on each of these metrics that we highlighted. So the energy is established, we'll be doing that. Water, if it's being reported. Transportation is under development, but then the occupant health, uh, health pillar as well will be included in this sort of comprehensive report in, in future years. So this is sort of what we do, and that is my role is to facilitate the exchange of this data and the analysis of how the buildings are performing. But we also recognize that you can have education, you can share your data, but really what are we talking about? We're talking about solutions and the real value of the 2030 district is, is it is a collaborative network that convenes solutions providers to how to reduce and hit their, reduce their building's utility consumption. So two programs that we, two things that we offer or will be offering, uh, each of our members get access to a professional partners director that provide different services towards these different solutions. Uh, this is a picture of one of the design and architecture firms founding member of the 2030 district, to just give you one example. And then we've also been working collaboratively <clears throat> um, at, to establish what we're referring to as a building walkthrough program. This is essentially a building level audit that would be implemented by our professional partners, qualified professional partners, to provide members an overview of how their building is performing, key equipment review, and sort of opportunities that that building might have for energy savings, water savings, et cetera. So that we worked this past year with a group of, uh, of our members and partners. 
uh, on, uh, on an, what we're referring to as our 2030 energy impact team to uh, write this criteria, write this program. It's informed by uh, national standards. And then in 2021, we'll seek to convene and implement this program and offer this as a service to any 2030 building member that would want to identify opportunities for energy savings. So, and then lastly, what, uh, and this is probably the most exciting thing is that we also offer, you know, in, in certain circumstances, we've had access to funds that we can award for specific energy projects. And in 2020, we were able to work with four of our building members to implement different energy efficiency solutions through a fund that we had. So we were able to provide uh, funding to the Cincinnati Art Museum to do improvements on the air handling unit in their FATH auditorium. That was with Siemens and uh, CMTA Engineering. Uh, the MCA Center or the Mercantile Library Building, specifically that facility, will be doing a LED lighting retrofit on their office tower with uh, Johnson Electric. Um, Our Lady of Grace Catholic School will be working with two of our IBW union electrical contractors to do a lighting retrofit. And then Sleepy Bee Cafe downtown, um, oops, Sleepy Bee Cafe downtown will be working with Malink Corporation to install a kitchen hood system, a high efficiency kitchen hood system. And I know Steve Malink has spoken to the Rotary Club before. So we were able to award these grants um, to different building members. So really, you know, kind of highlighting the value of the collaboration between the members and the partners to achieving these goals. And so that with that, I will uh, pause and take time for questions. I hope hopefully that was close to being what I committed to timing wise. Um, and, uh, and, and, and look forward to uh, answering your questions. So Tom, um, there's several facets to this question from Carlene. I'm sorry, you're breaking up a little bit, Jody. Uh, it happens when a plane goes over. Um, there's um, a couple of different questions. One is from Colleen McGuigan. She has several parts to her question. Uh, she's, saying, she's saying that she assumes there's a 50% reduction for energy. Is actually 50%. I'm having a hard time hearing you. Is this the question from uh, Colleen? Colleen? Okay. Yeah. I'll, uh, I, uh, so the question, I assume that the 50% reduction for energy is a 50% reduction on reliance of fossil fuels. How much of the city's solar farm will help reduce this? What percentage, what kind of transportation data do you collect? Number of types of vehicles, fleet miles driven, something else. These are all fantastic questions. Um, yes, Colleen, you're right. It is a 50% reduction and specifically... Uh, fossil fuel based energy. Um, so if you're building uh, purchases solar energy or has installed solar energy on site that can be subtracted from uh, your uh, emissions related data that we end up collecting and compiling and reporting on. Um, so there is a little bit of nuance between the difference between uh, what you would refer to as on-site renewables, like that would be having solar panels on your building and what is also known as off-site renewables. You know, if you are buying or purchasing electricity from off-site, that's, there's not necessarily, you're basically purchasing a guarantee that you are uh, to, to scale a project. And so we can't, you know, that it's a, it gets a little bit trickier on the accounting side to measure how that impacts your specific building because the electricity that you generate from that offsite facility might not directly go towards your building. But that being said, um, we do encourage the city solar project is in the, our, our key partners for us because what we're hoping to do is once that project scales and becomes accessible is work to with 2030 members to get them access to purchasing solar energy from that uh, array once it's installed. Now, I don't have any more details other than that, but that seems like a key opportunity to have work with 2030 members to try to procure their electricity from the solar array. Um, but, but, but we do track the solar if it's generated on site or generated off site. Um, and, and, and our reductions are tied to the reductions in fossil fuels specifically. So, to answer your questions about transportation data, very basically, we haven't established that metric yet, but essentially what we would be doing is it's, it's trying to avoid, similar to the energy question, you're trying to avoid the usage of fossil fuels specifically. So what we would be collecting is vehicle miles traveled. 
Um, so essentially you can calculate an emissions rate depending on your mode of transportation. And then we would be surveying our building members on how their employees are commuting to their building. And then we would calculate based on, uh, based on national data, how, how carbon intensive their commuting workforce is depending on the vehicle mix and the transportation miles traveled. So those metrics are still under development. Um, but you know, while we you know, certainly encourage the use of electric cars, that's certainly one solution that certainly seems to be the solution that gets the most attention. We're also talking about things like increasing bicycle access because that's a zero carbon emission commuting or transportation method. Um, you know, which also includes utilizing our transit system with the passage of, uh, you know, the passage of issue seven, the tax and levy on, um, to improve the perform, uh, the services of our metro system, working with human resources providers to incentivize human resources uh, within these member buildings to try to encourage people to use buses, public transportation, as a, as a mechanism to help your building, your, your buildings and help reduce the emissions associated with commuting to your building. So that, that's the type of information we would collect from members is that data on how they're, they're commuting to their property and calculating how much carbon is associated with those different modes. Um, and then, uh, and, and, and that would apply for fleets too, but we haven't, that, that, that metric is still being established and we're working with OKI to, uh, to formulate that more explicitly. Um, we've got a question from Ariel about the Energy Foundation the, um, and if it's based in Cincinnati. The Energy Foundation is actually based in San Francisco. Um, they do fund a lot of different types of projects, but their focus of late has been on how to scale localized solutions um, they do tend to give money to established organizations and city governments. They provide a lot of technical assistance. Um, and so the Energy Foundation was one of the funders that was a part of this broader consortium of, uh, uh, of groups that created this, uh, this program called the American Cities Climate Challenge, of which the city of Cincinnati's Office of Environment and Sustainability received um, quite a substantial amount of money to receive technical assistance that informed a lot of the programs that Ollie discussed, but also some of the other uh, initiatives coming out of the CINCI. Uh, the EV CINCI program comes to mind the, uh, uh, as one example. Um, and, and so the, that technical assistance and funding um, was part of a broader coalition of groups trying to scale climate related policy and initiatives at uh, the city level um, and energy foundation also supported us because we work specifically with kind of measuring building performance and, and the associated carbon emissions. Um, I can keep reading the questions, but I'd be happy to stop talking if anybody would like to ask their question out loud. Joe, that would be fun. There's one here from Beth. Is there an ongoing effort to recruit more participants such as apartment buildings and other local governments in the region? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, so the, the, I, we do get a lot of questions pertaining to the boundary. So you don't have to, as a business, you can commit to the 2030 district goals and we can measure your progress and provide reports and connect you with all the service providers, the same as if you fall within the geographic boundary itself. So our initiative actually has three, uh, four local governments participating and committing their municipal buildings. So the city of Cincinnati, Hamilton County, the two biggest, but also the village of Silverton and the city of Forest Park also committed um, towards these goals. So even though those two, uh, those two uh, municipal governments don't fall within the boundary, they have a vested interest in getting the access, technical expertise, um, associated with benchmarking the performance of their facilities. And, uh, and so they, they've committed on to, onto that goal as well. Um, I, am seeing, I am seeing a question about uh, whether Messer Construction is involved. We have had many conversations with Messer Construction. We are thinking that at some point they will likely, hopefully, can join as a, as a professional partner um, and a building owner, hopefully, as well. Um, let's see. There's one from Brian Miller. It yeah. says, with so many methods 
considered due to COVID, I would imagine energy consumption has decreased substantially. Um, may make this year's progress look good while challenging next year's performance for presuming people are back in those offices. Mm -hmm. Does any person with a green umbrella work directly with facilities managers? Yeah, that's a comp that is a evolving, ongoing, and highly complicated question that has a lot of different answers depending on who you're talking to. So I will, I will do my best to represent how I think our progress is going to look next year based on the information that I have received. Um, so broadly speaking, there was a significant reduction in energy consumption from the commercial building sector at the start of the pandemic in the United States as a result of the shutdowns. Uh, that goes without saying. Um, Energy Star, uh, the, the program that we use uh, to measure our building's progress, did has done some analysis on how big that impact was. Um, some of the results are still pending, but what they found broadly is that the reductions while not notable, were not significantly higher or lower than you would have expected. And so what you saw after that big ramping down was that you had a ramping back up. And so what we anticipate that building members will likely have an improved performance um, for calendar year 2020. It's not necessarily a guarantee. You still are heating, you're still cooling spaces. Um, and so you know, whether or not you have, you know, 20% occupancy or 100% occupancy, you know, that, you know, you're not, you can't fully shut down the building itself. So it is unclear as of today, what that will look like for those buildings. Um, one of the, we, there's been a lot of conversations on uh, to address some of the concerns with COVID, did your building decide to increase the volume of outside air that it was pumping into the building? If you did that, then you might actually have a higher energy consumption profile than you might have had you been under a quote unquote normal situations as those systems are working more intensely over a longer period of time. So, you know, there is no kind of one size fits all um, assessment of how the buildings performed in the aggregate. What we have seen is that while yes, there is, there was a reduction early uh, that that reduction might not have been as significant as people anticipated. And we'll look forward to seeing what that looked like for our buildings um, in the next year. But it is a good question. I know that facility managers are certainly the unsung heroes of this crisis, getting the buildings up to code, maintaining operational performance while also addressing the health and safety concerns of their buildings is a very difficult task, especially if you're also given uh, the mandate to try to reduce the energy consumption of your facility at the same time. Um, let's see. Yeah, so we do get a lot of questions about whether or not a program like this could be expanded to residential providers. To my knowledge, there is not necessarily a kind of national effort that focuses on in, in maybe in this specific type of way on residential con prov uh, consumers, uh, residential buildings, sorry. Um, I think the biggest reason of that for that is it's just, uh, it's just difficult. Um, <laughs> You know, commercial buildings, there is this national standard. The Energy Star Portfolio Manager tool is a, informed by a national survey of commercial building consumption. That type of data source does exist in the residential side, but there's not necessarily a tool like Portfolio Manager that allows you to compare yourself to other buildings nationally. One program that does exist is the HERS program, H-E-R, Home Energy Rating, I believe, system. HERS is a kind of a home energy criteria, sort of like Energy Star, um, you, where you kind of can assess the performance of a home and they have, nat they have index data that shows different types of consumption patterns. But Energy Star also has a homes program. There's a program called Energy Star for Homes, similar, providing education, um, resources about how to measure your home's energy. Um, I think that for our, for our program specifically, we're really focused on the biggest buildings that are consuming the most resources. And by 
reducing the impacts of those buildings, you have a larger impact in the aggregate. Uh, and then, you know, and you also are dealing with buildings, at least when you think of a commercial office space, you know, the, the variability between one office to another could be big, but it's not nearly as big as, you know, a home that's 100, in, 100 years old that's never been renovated or has only been modestly renovated. And so you just, you have a sort of, you start to get into a lack of uniformity and profile, and that makes it hard to compare. Um, but, uh, but so that, and, and really, you know, the commercial buildings in particular are, are you know, the consumption of commercial buildings is higher um, than residential buildings. So that's sort of why we focus in that lens um, specifically. So um, that's, that being said, I mean, there is a lot of programs you can take advantage of that will give you information on residential energy performance. But I would say that for our program, we're really kind of zeroed in on the commercial built environment. Um, let's see, did I miss any of the questions? Um, yeah, so Beth wrote, uh, is there an ongoing effort to recruit more participants such as apartment buildings and other local governments? I, I touched on that briefly. Uh, I, I will be happy to share with Ariel our uh, how to join page with information on whether or not your building uh, or an organization that you're affiliated with might be interested in participating in this initiative or this type of program. Um, I would say that uh, we are, some of our member buildings do have residential space. Um, so, if your building is mixed use, you can participate. You certainly can participate in the program, um, but we do draw a distinction between, uh, uh, as, and like for instance, Energy Star does have a benchmarked criteria for multifamily homes. So multifamily homes could be incorporated into this model pretty easily. Once you start to get into sort of your smaller, four, two unit, four unit duplex apartment buildings, then those lines get blurred a little bit. But certainly for your big multifamily high rise buildings, the, those, those types of buildings could participate in this type of program. And uh, you, you'll probably hear a lot more about the work being done in the multifamily space from my uh, colleague, Savannah, who's gonna be in session four. Uh, Savannah is also an IU uh, alumni. We were actually classmates, <laughs> believe it or not, <laughs> at IU. And she's fantastic. Um, and so that session will have a lot of detail about the efforts to address sort of energy performance um, of buildings, but really focus on uh, energy burden and the financial costs of uh, uh, in, the, in the multifamily space. Um, I would like to say something about that too that really struck me in the webinar that Savannah and uh, Carla gave through Green Umbrella a few weeks ago. That is the use of maps to prioritize areas, to find areas where people are particularly hard hit, and then to focus the intervention on those areas, areas where um, people will be paying over 20% of their monthly income on utilities, for example. And those tend to be areas with a higher burden of bad health as well. So the, the mapping is really helpful in the planning, and I was impressed by that. Yeah, they, they've done quite a bit of detailed research uh, on neighborhood by neighborhood level. It's been really fantastic. Um, I, I do got a question about uh, whether other cities will be forming 2030 districts and sort of, you know, noticing Chicago is not in the mix. Are there other competing organizations doing the same thing? There's no, I would say there's no competing nonprofits, but there are other cities that are more progressive with what they're requiring from a benchmarking standpoint. So really what we're talking about here is energy benchmarking um, of buildings, setting a threshold and measuring, uh, make, ensuring that your building exceeds that threshold. So these types of ordinances are becoming increasingly popularized and Chicago has a benchmarking ordinance. Actually, some of the other 2030 districts do as well, Pittsburgh, um, New York City. So essentially any commercial building in that space has to meet a target determined by the, the local government. And if they fail to meet that target, then they could, are subject to fine. Um, and so we do not have, and, and in some cases you have these programs in Chicago and I know they have like a building, they have like a, you can get a certification or your building can earn an award for exceptional performance, for instance. So, you know, we, in some cities, this program is um, less pertinent because of the, uh, uh, the local laws and ordinances that are in place to incentivize buildings to measure their performance. 
but I would say that um, what distinguishes the 2030 district is its, is its ambition. It goes kind of beyond that basic benchmarking ordinance. Um, and so what we're really doing is asking people to strive beyond the minimum. Uh, and so while some cities might have a more robust city-led program, um, there would be space for this type of program to exist. It's just a question of whether or not there's the local interest in the program and whether or not um, there's uh, able to secure adequate funding to, to launch the, this type of initiative. Um, let's see, I think. I have a question um, about um, the ongoing funding for your program. You mentioned that you had startup funding, which was very helpful from the Duke um, Fund. Uh, who are the stakeholders who would benefit from continuing to underwrite this kind of initiative? What is the win-win? Well, any, any, what we really do is we provide a service for organizations that are interested in reducing their energy consumption, which has a financial windfall. But really what I think our big fundamental supporters are companies that have solutions that they want to scale. And so there's an interest in providing being this non-biased, impartial advocate for energy reductions and a conduit from technology service providers to building owners and managers. And we kind of, we were sort of blend in that middle ground effectively to, to scale solutions. And so what we've seen in terms of our commitments and our financial support, it's really been, there's been a lot of different avenues. We get commitment from those solution providers. We do charge a fee for our professional partners to be included in our directory and to have their information shared with our members. That is a source of revenue. We also get revenue from grants that are interested in scaling programs to improve energy efficiency. That's been a source of funding, but also companies that just have a vested interest in sustainability as a concept are also interested in, in supporting this work because we are convening a diverse group of buildings around different issues. And our big sales pitch is that if you can get a critical mass of people interested in a particular opportunity, that net benefit reduces the cost of that solution to the, to the whole group. And so we kind of work in that way. We sell ourselves in that way. All of our virtual events, uh, organizations can sponsor that event if they would like to talk about their particular services. Um, that's an opportunity. And then we also get a small portion of our funding from individual donations as well via Green Umbrella. Down the road, we would anticipate that as momentum continues to build towards sustainability, particularly in the built environment, that there might be opportunities to be a conduit for different funding that might come down from the federal level or state level, maybe not state level, but certainly local level to advance some of these goals. Um, but we will, uh, you know, and so the city has a vested interest in the Green Cincinnati Plan, as Ollie described, to hit these reduction targets. They have their goals but they also need help to, to do this. And we really kind of provide this mechanism towards starting down your path towards sustainability in the built environment. And we're optimistic that with this health pillar, that that is gonna attract um, uh, um, in, in funders that are interested in scaling health solutions or looking at health solutions from a systems level in a different way as it pertains to the built environment, not necessarily the outcome. So I think we're uniquely positioned to uh, facilitate a lot of different f interests from different types of funders. Um, and so we have been fortunate to receive some sponsorships recently and have had a great support from the local electrical workers union, um, as well as some other companies. But um, that'll continue to be an ongoing conversation as every, anybody who has been involved with nonprofits know, you know, we're certainly not shy about opening up our hands. So we will continue to do that. Um, and moving forward. But thank you for the question. Um, I got another question from Brian about uh, how much individual city districts cooperate with each other, sharing ideas, what works, what doesn't. Um, yeah, exactly. So JL, JLL, for example, does is a member in different 2030 districts. So mostly our network works to collaborate on, like I would say that specific solutions 
So there's a museum working group, for instance. It's really kind of hard to measure the energy performance of museums. <laughs> and so, you know, we have sort of a collaborative network that's, co you know, convening on that subject of how do we work in th this context for, for is one example. Um, but yeah, you know, really, I, I, I think, I, you know, bears mentioning that while we have the uniformity of the national brand, that we are working on the same solutions, we really are scaling kind of the programs from the local context and what's available to us in our region. And so as much as the network provides that sort of fundamental goal, we really kind of work independently of the network to actually advance the solutions here. So I'd say mostly the benefit of the national network is the information sharing piece. And, uh, and, and, that has been, um, and that has been crucial, especially as we look to our peer districts to identify opportunities and different solutions that we can provide. May I ask another question? Of course. Would you be willing to record a little update uh, for us to post when you do have the data um, later this week? I'd be happy for to. convenience? Yeah. That would really be sort of fun to get a scoop on that. Yeah, I, I, I literally have the charts behind this uh, PowerPoint presentation right now, and I, but I would, be, uh, <laughs> it would not be prudent for me to reveal that information <laughs> before it's officially released. But we will be uh, releasing our first progress report that measures the performance of a group of our buildings that fall within our district boundaries within the next week. And then that report will kind of provide a more detailed overview of the metrics and sort of where we're going from here. So we were able to do that in breakneck time. Most 2030 districts take several years, more than several years to actually get enough building data where they can report on this, but we've been able to get it quickly within two years. And that's in large part, thanks to just the really strong commitment we got from the community for this initiative. And, and we hope that that momentum will continue and, and that that report will help help us continue to grow what we're trying to do and what we're trying to strive for in terms of reducing our carbon, our carbon emissions and climate impact from our built environment. Great. And Tom, we thank you so much for presenting tonight. Uh, it's, it's been really good. Great information, great questions too. Uh, great to have this level of participation among everyone. And I just want to thank everybody who joined tonight. We really appreciate that you see the value in the seminar series. We as a Rotary Club really do want to make it open to the community and encourage you to invite any friends or colleagues to it. Uh, we obviously have some Rotarians on this as well, but we have a number of other people in the community. Uh, we open it up to all. It's public. Uh, students uh, might have an interest as well, so please feel free to invite them and uh, Tom Schultz, thank you so much. Just a great presentation, great, great information. And I want to express our thanks to your organization, Green Umbrella. You have been a great partner to our Rotary Club's sustainability task force. Uh, just huge. Uh, you have, and Ryan Mooney Bullock has, and, and a number of other people as well. So thank you for that. And I just want to remind everybody on uh, the Zoom call tonight, that our next seminar in the seminar series is on January 5th at 7.30 p.m. Again, open to all. Our speaker will be Rotarian Chip Carson, who's got an MD and a PhD. He's a professor, toxicologist, and environmental and occupational physician whose research and consultation is global, and he will explain why climate change is the greatest single future threat to the health of children worldwide through impacts, including extreme weather events, emerging disease and famine. And he'll outline ways we can mitigate a catastrophic future. Uh, we as Rotary Club and all Rotarians worldwide, we all do care for vulnerable children. It's one of our focus areas. So I know that uh, Dr. Carson's presentation will be really helpful. Look forward to that on January 5th. Uh, please join us and in the meantime, wishing everybody a very happy holidays. And thanks again, Tom, for your presentation. Thank you for having me, it was a pleasure.